My guest today is Babs Omotowa. Babs is a global leader in the oil and gas industry. He is currently the chairman advisory board of Montserrado Oil and Gas BV Netherlands and a non-executive director at Pearl Hill Technologies USA. He was the upstream vice president, safety and environment across Deepwater, Shale Unconventional, Conventional and non-operated joint ventures in 40 countries across the globe. His responsibilities included environment, energy transition, climate change, greenhouse gas, asset integrity management, process management and personal safety. He was previously the managing director, CEO of Nigeria LNG and the managing director, CEO of Boni Gas Transport Company. Nigeria LNG contributed about 14% of the government revenue in taxes and dividends during his tenure. While at NLNG, he led the transformation of the company through new strategy and culture, with positioning commercial relationships with customers and driving superior technical and financial outcomes resulting in $40 billion revenue. Babs led the construction of engineering laboratories worth $2 million in some leading universities in Nigeria. He secured $2 billion international financing to build six LNG ships developing local competence for 600 Nigerians in shipbuilding. A former vice president for Sub-Sahara Africa and a former director of the Shell Petroleum Development Company, SPDC, Babs joined Shell in 1993 working in the Worry Warehouse. He later proceeded to the United Kingdom where he handled a few international managerial roles in production, transformation, and shipping in UK and Europe. He was general manager supply chain for Stepco and SPDC and was also the global president of the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply, CIPS. Babs was also a non-executive director of West Africa Pipeline Company, WAPCO. He holds a bachelor's degree in industrial chemistry and a master's in a business administration degree from the University of Lorry, Nigeria. He also holds a master's of business administration degree from University of Leicester, United Kingdom. He has attended several leadership programs at Harvard, INSEAD, and the International Institute for Management Development, IMD Business School. Babs is renowned for commercial, strategic, transformation, successful turnaround, and maximizing value. He is epitomized by his personal core values of humility integrity and excellence. Who is Baba Tunde Jolayemi Omotoa? Well, that's a, a, a tough question to answer, I would say, because uh, there are many parts of Babs Omotoa. Uh, the most important part, of course, is uh, family and God. Uh, married with three children, uh, I'm a Christian. Uh, I've uh, had the checkered uh, career in the oil and gas industry, uh, but you know, I always like to describe myself as uh, the son of a farmer and uh, a teacher. Uh, why do I describe myself as such? Uh, my father, of course, was a farmer, and um, when I was growing up, uh, we spent most of the weekends or during holidays uh, going to farms. 
and, and I love going to farms. Uh, I learned quite a lot on the farm and some of my core values on hard work and perseverance I, I got from the farm. Uh, the other thing about, I say about myself is I'm a teacher. Uh, I started my career actually as a teacher in a secondary school, taught chemistry and mathematics. And that's been the best job I've ever done in my, in my life. And uh, what I love most about it was the transformation of, of people. The, you have young people coming to school, they know little or nothing. By the time they are true, they, they are really very knowledgeable. So, you know, when I look at my career uh, in Shell and other places I've worked, the part I love the most is the coaching and mentoring of, of young people because that gives me lots of fulfillment. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, you're a married man with three boys. Uh, being a busy executive, how do you balance the demand from work and your family commitment, what you call the work-life balance? Uh, what advice do you have for uh, someone who is busy and who has a family as well? It's, uh, you know, it's one of the big challenges uh, in modern day because, uh, of course, with uh, connectivity and uh, the ability to work uh, remotely, uh, you find that executives uh, these days work most hours. Uh, it was quite a challenge for me and um, it was probably one of the reasons why I took a uh, decision to retire early from, from Shell because, uh, of course, you know, working at a different location from where my family was uh, meant that I could not see my family as much as I would have, have wanted to. Uh, my children were growing up very, very fast and, uh, you know, I didn't want to miss out on all the growing up years. Uh, my youngest uh, son is now about finishing secondary school. The oldest is already finishing uh, his first degree. So I didn't want to miss out totally on their growing up life. But the big challenge uh, in the modern day is, of course, that uh, work-life balance. And my best advice for young people is, you know, your family must come as priority. Uh, there is no work or any other thing that is more important than that. So you must find time and provide time for that. Uh, and, you know, you need to find the best way that works for you and your family. Uh, for some families, you know, you can uh, have that, uh, you know, have your weekends to yourselves. You can make sure you can switch off your laptop, switch off your telephones when you are uh, on holidays. Uh, and, and utilize all those sort of opportunities. Don't don't push your holidays uh, into the future. You know, make use of it as, as early as you can. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very good advice uh, from, from someone who's walked uh, the path. Uh, congratulations um, on your on your book that will be released very soon. Uh, from storeroom to boardroom, uh, I have paid for mine and looking forward to receiving uh, the copy uh, once it's released in a couple of months. I had the privilege um, of going through, you know, the manuscript uh, over a year ago, you shared it with me. Uh, uh, something that caught my attention uh, was the fact that you failed year four. You know, and I was like, ooh, okay. Um, I saw some peer pressure uh, coming up even in that story. Uh, I saw you said you, you went to smoking, drinking, partying, uh, trancy. Uh, let me read um, an excerpt pro from the book, even while I ask my question. Uh, it says, uh, the teacher walked up behind me and um, repeated that I stand up. I asked to know what I'd done uh, and why I should be so humiliated. He refused to say. Uh, the situation escalated, then he pulled me by my collar. I told him that he was choking me, uh, but he continued to talk. I felt, I felt I was being strangled. So in an effort to free myself, I turned around and hit him. Peer pressure is real, not just for teenagers, but for executives as well. Uh, what is the greatest lesson uh, from that experience? Mm, that's um, a tough one to find the greatest, but I think you know there were a few lessons. I'll probably mention two or three of them. The first one I will say is, you know, be clear what your core values are and be guided by those core values. I was uh, a bit uh, youthful exuberance, I would say at that time, you know, friends uh, that I started to make friends with, especially my fourth year, you know, my first uh, three years, uh, I was quite a model student. I was in the top uh, of the class in, in those first three years. But in the fourth year, I started to mix with uh, friends who taught me quite a lot of uh, things that uh, I wouldn't be proud of today, but uh, there are things that I shared in the book. Um, and, and what I learned from that were a few lessons. Uh, you know, the first one I will say is, uh, 
your past successes are not a predictor of your future success. The fact that I was in the top of the class in my first three years did not guarantee I would you know, continue to be top in, in future years. Uh, and you know, by having to repeat, which was quite uh, a shock for me, uh, it really told me, taught me a lesson. And, and what that means, uh, what I'll say to executives today is, you know, don't be carried away by your past successes. Your, your past successes are gone. Uh, what you did yesterday that made you successful may not make you successful tomorrow because the world is changing and, and you know, new things are coming up, new challenges are coming up. So the first thing I would say is, you know, past successes are not a predictor of future success and don't, be, don't rely too much on your past success. The second thing I would say is, you know, um, you need to focus, you know, I wasn't focused. I, I got distracted by friends and some of the things that I was uh, doing, you know, I started to drink, I started to uh, follow them to parties and all of that. Um, and so I didn't concentrate on what, what I should have focused on, which was my study. And, you know, when I think of it today, I would say executives, you need to focus on what you can control. Don't spend too much time on things you can't control. Do the best that you can on the things you can control, and it will likely have effect on even those things you cannot control. You can't solve world hunger, so never try as an executive to boil the ocean. Uh, but those things that you control, make sure down that you do the best out of them. And the last, as I said at the beginning, will be I will say, you know, have your core values and make sure that those core values help you to navigate where you find yourself in dilemmas and you find yourself in difficult situations. It should be your lighthouse to guide you in the decisions you make and the actions you take. So, you know, those would be things I would say from that particular example. But the book itself is, you know, tells quite a lot. It goes through my 30 plus years working as a teacher, working in the oil industry. It talks about what I learned, about how things that made me successful that allowed me to grow from the boardroom, from the storeroom to the boardroom. Uh, things, the traits and characteristics that made me successful, but also what organizations will face, especially multinationals in developing countries and how they can navigate through that. For me, integrity and courage were two of the most important uh, and those define me uh, and define most of what I write in the book as well. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, talking about courage, I'll go right to my next question. Um, you have the reputation of shocking of organization, turning it on its head, literally. You're treading on chartered territories, uh, very fast pace. I recall uh, when you became my vice president, I think it's late 2000, 2008, 2009. You know, we just came out of a, a reorganization and the team I was leading was optimized from like 52 positions to 32 positions. We lost, you know, 20 people. So it was quite a challenging period for me. Then you became my vice president. We had a one-on-one. -on -one. And you told me that you didn't think 32 was the right number. You thought it was was four. You know, essentially, we should move from 32 to four. <laughs> you are no longer my line manager. You are no longer the system. So I can tell you how I felt, really. <laughs> you know, after the meeting, I, I said, who is this Babs? Is it crazy? I mean, how on earth? What's he thinking about? Can we move from 32 that I'm struggling with now uh, to four? You know, however, you know, as you unfolded the vision, as you showed me data, you know, benchmark, and, you know, you showed me how it was possible with technology and all that, you know, it became clear that indeed it was possible. And and I think, you know, I think we, we, didn't, we didn't get to four. We, we ended at about 10 staff uh, from, from 32. Um, then I moved to another role. I moved to being the head of um, uh, land logistics. Uh, then yeah, I think later, a few months later, you moved to, uh, to NLNG. And that, that was just my team. Um, I recall other managers within the directorate had similar uh, encounters with you. Even when I came to NLNG uh, to do some project uh, work, um, I also had such stories. Uh, the fact is that Babs is, is courageous. So my question is, how are you able to demonstrate uh, such courage despite the naysayers? And, and let me ask you another question. So two questions. And how can you, uh, how can someone who is working in an unforgiving environment demonstrate courage? So, so I think, you know, maybe a reflection would be to think of um, how, you know, I, you know, came to some of the uh, characteristics that you describe. I think while growing up in Nigeria, uh, one of the first things that really struck me was uh, seeing a number of, you know, uh, big organizations and big companies in Nigeria, like the airways, the shipping line, 
a lot of uh, iron and steel companies, seeing them fold up. Uh, and I was struck by those, uh, especially because Nigerians are really bright people, uh, exuberant and uh, really well knowledgeable. Uh, and I, I, I try to understand why, you know, have a country with such talents still uh, managed to not run organizations well or run even uh, the country as best as it should. Um, and, and it dawned on me after quite some, some study that we, we, as a people and as, a, um, as organizations, we sometimes, you know, rest on our oars. We rest on our past history. We rest on our past successes. Uh, and we don't seize the opportunity to, you know, even move forward uh, much stronger. And I, I started then to understand what, you know, is described as best practices, uh, the concept of best practice. And, you know, it became clear to me growing up then that, you know, we could, as a country, as a people, uh, reach best practices because, you know, as I said, Nigerians are bright. We had the resources, we had the people. Uh, so what was left, I, I found, was one, having the vision of what that best practice is and, and having the courage to drive towards that. Um, and I, I was, you know, strengthened by the fact that this is what is, was required to make organizations really progress rather than the history we had where, you know, big companies in Nigeria folded up. Uh, so that was the background. And, um, you know, I would also say that I, I also grew in a home where my father was a strict disciplinarian, a man also of tremendous integrity. And, and what I learned about from him about integrity is, you know, right is right. And what right is right means is that you really could be seen as very clear what you want to do and, and that's what you're going to do. You're not going to bend, you're not going to uh, change. Uh, and, and so I think a combination of those drove the the mindset, the courage, or the mindset for real uh, top quarter performance that Nigerians can achieve best practices. We can deliver the best uh, values that any, anyone can do in the world. And I wanted organizations to be successful, not to uh, run organizations that will, you know, collapse as we saw many of those airways, shipping lines uh, in the past. So, so those were, you know, key things in my mind that drove my approach. Uh, and indeed, you know, in every role that I went to, uh, it was always, you know, firstly, of course, it was about people. It was making sure that I found the, the right talent for, for the roles. And, you know, one of the things I always love to do is to find talents that are even brighter than myself. I think, you know, the best thing that I can work is when I'm the least bright of the team that I lead. Uh, so I'm always looking out for, for really talents. Uh, and once you have talents in the team and you can create a vision uh, based on best practices that exist in the world, uh, then, you know, the, 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 there is no stopping such an organization. And as you described, you know, there was no stopping many of the organizations that I worked in from indeed moving, uh, you know, towards the best practices in, in the world. Uh, indeed, and, and as you're speaking, I remember those those words: best practices, top quartile, you know, <laughs> benchmarking. Uh, your last role, your last role uh, in Shell was a global functional VP. Uh, that means you know your accountability cut across you know 40 upstream upstream countries, uh, including you know Canada, uh, the United States, like three countries in Latin America, the UK, Holland. Nigeria, Egypt, Oman, Philippines, Malaysia, Russia, Iraq, and many others. Uh, being in charge of safety and environment in an industry with loads of high risk activities, uh, knowing that anything can go wrong in any part of the world, how do you deal with stress and with anxiety? I think, you know, as a leader, you, you have to be able to to manage uh, stress. I remember a story told of uh, the great Nelson Mandela. He was flying on a plane once and uh, it, you know, it was a small plane, so much turbulence. And um, you know, people who were in him, with him in the flight were becoming very stressed and you know, they were afraid. And uh, they looked at him and he was reading the newspaper 
you know, throughout. And as the plane was rocking and uh, having a turbulent fly, he, he just was reading his newspaper. So when they landed, you know, one of the uh, people who was on the flight with him just couldn't but go up to Nelson and say, Nelson Mandela, how did you manage to stay calm under such uh, pressure? And he said, look, you know, I was as afraid as you were, but I knew that if I show any sign of of being afraid, then it means that the rest of you will suddenly feel the world is coming to an end. Uh, and that's the role of a leader, that even in, in crisis and in stressful situations, you have to uh, remain calm, because the moment you start to demonstrate anything other than being calm, then the rest of the organization really, you know, they, they, they feel the world is coming to an end. Um, again, you know, back to the 40 country, uh, responsibility. Um, the first thing in any role, as I said, is to find the talents. And I was very fortunate in, in the role as VP uh, across the upstream that I had the privilege to be able to select uh, some of my team uh, members. And I went for the best. I mean, I, I had some of the best staff that um, you know, worked in the company, worked for me at that, at that time. And once you have that, uh, you know your role as a leader your, the biggest impact you have as a leader is in your selection of the people that work for you once you select the right people your job is half done because they have the capacity they have the competence they have the ability to to manage uh, the task in front of them your role then becomes two things create the vision uh, jointly created with them so you work with the team to build a vision and then after that, your role is just to support them, to motivate them, to coach them, to guide them, uh, and, and they will fulfill the role. So, so I had, you know, the right talent in, in, in many of the locations. They were the, some of the brightest in the company. We had worked together to create the vision of what we wanted to do. Uh, and, you know, what you should never do is panic as a leader, even when some of your plans don't work, uh, because, you know, you might plan everything. Some, you get some shocks. You never panic. You, you address the situation uh, and, and address it. And I think, you know, we, we put structures in place driven by some of the best people that I had in the team that, um, you know, we didn't have to fight too many fires. I, I think one of the things that I like to do a lot in any role that I work is have a long-term vision, a long-term plan. Because once you can do that, then it minimizes your firefighting. Uh, it's only if you don't have long-term plans that you start to fight fires uh, regularly. Uh, so, you know, I will say having the best people, having very good vision and working together with the team to develop that, having clear long-term plans to, to drive the processes and supporting my team, motivating them, coaching them, helping them to address issues and building relationships around them as well uh, enabled us to, you know, really, I think it was a successful organization during the time that I was uh, in that role. Thank you so much. Life should be understood backwards and it must be lived forward. Uh, uh, Self-awareness gives you the capacity to learn from your mistake. Uh, you are a continuous improvement advocate. Uh, so with the CI mindset, I want you to look back at your years as an, as an employee and I want you to share with me uh, your greatest regrets um, and, and what you will have done differently. Three months into my role in, uh, as the MD of Nigeria LNG, uh, we lost a young man called Kingsley. Uh, Kingsley uh, was 27 years old. I was working for a specialist contractor uh, and um, he was cleaning some of our slug catchers um, and the corrosion probe tool that he was using retracted and, and hit him in the chin and, and fatally injured him. Um, and, and that for me was the worst day of my, of my working career because you know, having a young man who still had parents and, and had a sister die was just not uh, something that I uh, ever wanted to see. And you know, when we investigated and, and tried to find some of why it happened, uh, one of the lessons for me was, uh, was a regret as well. You know, apart from the fact that we lost Kingsley, I regretted also that we, we 
could have prevented this. Because what we found out was that anytime we had what we call specialist contractors working in our facility, we kind of assumed that because they were specialists and because they were international companies, we kind of assumed that they knew what they were doing. So our oversight and our supervision was less and, and relaxed. And what we failed to understand at that time was that some of the staff who worked for them were still going through development as well. They, they were not specialists in that context. Uh, and so if we had actually provided the right level of supervision, uh, we could have uh, prevented this, this facility. So, so our mindset of specialist contractor uh, needed to have been different. And so for me, that was a big regret, a big regret that I lost somebody on that I watched, a big regret that we uh, had this concept of specialist contractors that, that didn't need to be. And if we had supervised a bit differently, the way we supervise other non-specialist contractors, we may have prevented the loss of this man. So this remained the, the biggest uh, regret I had. Uh, of course, I learned the lesson, as you said, and uh, you know, for the remaining four, five years of my career in NLNG, we didn't have any case of any fatality again, which which was indeed uh, more more fulfilling. It, did, it wouldn't bring things to bar, but I think we learned and uh, we, we made sure we didn't have to repeat that mistake again. Yeah, that's a, that's a rather sad experience. And um, good to know that at least you learned from it and the business became better. Whether or not we're conscious of it, success or failure in life uh, is a summation of the choices we make and the decisions we, we take. Uh, when we make a choice, we forego uh, the consequences of the alternatives. That is what economists refer to as opportunity cost. Uh, because my man is finite, uh, we choose to either invest or not to invest. We choose to either attend to this or attend to that, push forward or pull back, say yes or say no. Uh, someone said successful people make the right decisions early and manage such decisions uh, daily. Of course, all you need uh, are a few bad decisions to wreck your life. Could you tell me of a time when you had to make a difficult decision, which you knew its outcome had the potential to either make or mar you? I think one example, I mean, I've, I've had a few, I mean, I've had a few in my career. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's um, always interesting to look back at, at, at them now because, you know, making them then was indeed uh, a situation that if it had gone wrong, uh, you know, I would not have uh, had such a career that I've had. But I think one of them was uh, when I was VP still for logistics and infrastructure, HSC in, in shell companies in Nigeria. We had uh, one of the, the areas I managed was helicopter operations to our platforms and our locations. And we had this helicopter contract that had been with an international, international company for decades. I mean, they, they basically had been running that helicopter contract for, for us since I joined Shell. Um, and even long before I joined Shell, they've been running it. Um, we had never then had any other cost to use any company. But they, 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 became, they became a monopoly and they were really, um, I think, milking that. So they, they usually will come with increases and it was take it or leave it. Uh, and I felt, you know, this is not the right way to to have a company. And I thought clearly it's because they enjoy monopoly. And you know, at the same time, I thought, you know, why don't we even have local companies who could do this service? I mean, considering that this is a high HSC risk area, transporting people in helicopters was really high risk. Uh, and we didn't have Nigerian companies who were, you know, working in the oil industry at that time. So I then uh, started to work with my team and, and said, look, let's find the best Nigerian companies. Let's encourage them to really invest in themselves, find overseas partners and, uh, and be able to really stand the test of, of, of what an oil company will require in terms of standards. And we were you know, working with these local companies. Two of them really took the, the, um, the challenge. They, they found partners in, uh, in Denmark and Canada and 
started to develop their management system, their technical capabilities and all of it. And so at some point, uh, we felt that they had uh, really started to have the kind of capacity that we could, we could make use of. So I got the, the Shell technical authorities to come and audit and, and assure that they indeed can uh, perform uh, to the sort of challenges that we, we had in the oil and gas industry. And so our experts came from, from London and, and they came, they assessed them and they passed uh, the companies that they, they could indeed provide the service with the partnership they had formed. And so we went for a tender and as I expected, you know, the um, um, incumbent did not win because they had become quite expensive. They, they had just grown themselves beyond competition and the first time of, they were facing competition, they just didn't win. And so this local company won. And of course, you know, it became a pause time for everyone. Now that uh, uh, the local company has won, um, what's going to happen? And uh, of course, it was very clear to me what was going to happen. We're going to go forward with that company. They had won a tender, we had assessed them. Uh, and so I was summoned to my boss's office, uh, an expatriate, uh, you know, when I started to process this award. And he, you know, asked me about. He had he had just resumed about a few months before, and so he asked me about this. So so far, I've, I asked him first. I said, "You must be asking because somebody must have asked you because otherwise, you're relatively senior." He said, "Yes, there's concern, of course, from the from the aviation team uh, in the head office." So I said, "Well, uh, they cannot be concerned because I called them in to audit this uh, company, and they give the pass mark to the company." So. I have I have the uh, approval of, of, of the company has been capable, so uh, we needed to go forward. So he said, but perhaps you know this is a high risk area. And this company has never worked in the oil industry. Why would you, would you want to go forward? Uh, and I said, look, you know, we, we, we not only am I prepared to take the risk and go forward, I'm even going to ask for more things. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I, I actually have looked at their plan and they plan to lease helicopters for the seven year contract. I said, that's not acceptable. I want them to buy helicopters, but they cannot buy helicopters because they don't have enough funds. I said, so I want us, I'm going to ask us to borrow them money uh, to buy new helicopters. He says, Babs, you must be out of your mind. I have not even accepted that we should go forward with these contracts. You are even now asking for more. So I said, no, we're going to go forward with this contract. There's absolutely no reason not to go forward. They have been assessed and they have provided the best bid. Uh, it fits into our local content development plan as a company. We've been working here for 56 years. We cannot continue to say a local company cannot provide uh, this type of service. And so he said, okay, you know, if you're very sure of yourself, uh, you know, this can be a career ending decision. If anything happens in the seven years they're going to operate this, then you know, you'll be held responsible because the aviation team from the head office have flagged a warning. Uh, I have discussed with you and you are aware of this and you're still clear you want to go forward. And I said, yes, I'm very clear. And I'm going to bring the proposal for us to loan them $85 million. Uh, and um, of course, when I first brought the proposal, you know, again, everybody refused. The finance team and the head office refused. And I justified why, you know, we had to borrow their money. One, it was for our own safety. Two, um, we have committed as a company to develop local, uh, local capacity. We had a local competence local capacity development policy. So why why not put our money where our mouth was? Uh, and they said, but you know, this is unprecedented for a company to borrow contract of money. And in Nigeria, again, the risks are too high. They won't pay back. I said, they will pay back because I've asked them to bring a bank guarantee. So if they default, we will uh, call on the bank guarantee. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we, after quite a lot of discussions running over a week, they agreed and we borrowed them the money. So now the contract was awarded, money was loaned. So the risk became if anything happened during the seven years of the contract, if they either didn't pay back or there was an accident or an incident, of course I would have been uh, having to answer you know, a different uh, query or I may have actually had to leave the company. But fortunately, I think we had done enough due diligence. The company ran for seven years. There was no accident. The safety performance was about the best in the industry. Uh, the 
service performance was better than the previous, uh, and they had they repaid back all the money within the seven years uh, that uh, they wanted. Not only did they do that, they in the period developed capacity. They went on to win uh, contracts of other IOCs in Nigeria. They even won contracts of our IOCs outside Nigeria. Uh, and you know now we had a local company who is now able to provide that service to Nigerian companies. Uh, and by the time they did an extension for them, they actually reduced their price for that. So competition and the value became even larger. But I was more pleased that we could develop a local company, and you know it was a very it was a make or mark decision. And um, it, if it had gone the other way, it would have been a different conversation. But I think we had done the due diligence. We had. I needed to take the risk. I was prepared to, to uh, take that risk. I, I was confident that uh, they should perform. The risks were there. But if you don't take risk in life, you, you never progress. And if we never give them a chance, they will not be where they are today, winning contracts. They've built the, the biggest um, maintenance facility for helicopters in West Africa, accredited, uh, and other companies across West Africa are able to use them today. It's a real success story. But um, it required uh, taking um, that risk on them. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, uh, Babs. Um, I, I want to probe for that. You know, um, with your with your line manager, you know, calling you and you know challenging, you know, your decision, and you know, with the with the with the technical um, um, with the technical the SMEs as it were, also not supporting it, uh, it, will be, it, it, it will be a much easier decision for you to, uh, to, to call back, you know, the, uh, the, the, the guys that, um, that, have, that, you know, everybody trusted as it were, and probably, you know, gotten them to reduce the price and all that. So what drove you to, to, to see this through? What were you thinking? It was a high risk um, uh, decision. You were practically sticking your, your neck out, you know, for this decision. What was driving you? I know you talked about, you know, local content and developing a local supplier. W was that all? We had audited them. I had brought the technical authorities from the head office to audit them before we went for the tender. They gave them a clean bill of health that they were capable of doing it. Uh, they would then run a tender, they won the tender, they, they had been assessed, they had demonstrated that capacity to them, they have, they have played fair, they won a contract fairly, why should I not go forward? The only risk I saw, which is why I said I then was going to ask for 85 million to buy the aircraft, the only risk I saw was that they were going to be leasing, wet leasing helicopters. And I felt that was a, a risk because you know, you're, you're going to be leasing helicopters that have been used elsewhere. You don't know how well they've been used that much. So, so you could carry a risk that you are not so comfortable with. And so that was why I then said, look, if we got them, if we got them to buy brand new helicopters, then, you know, the risk were, were minimal because they've been audited, uh, they passed the audit, they have the right partnership, they have the right uh, management systems. Um, they were new, but everybody starts off being new once, you know, even the international company was new once. Somebody it had to be given a chance once. But for me, the issue was it's about doing the right thing. That's what always drives me in all my decisions. What is the right thing? I always say that a leader should not be driven by, you know, popularity. As a leader, you're not driven by what the majority says. You're not driven by what is the safest option. You should always be driven by what is the right thing. And if that drives you all the time, you will likely make the right decisions all the time. Doesn't mean it, will, it may not go wrong, but you would have still made the right decision. I would have still made that decision, even if, you know, even if something had happened, I would have still made the decision because it was the right decision to make. Thank you very much for sharing that perspective uh, uh, with me. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, your exit from Shell was a surprise to me. I mean, um, uh, what drove your decision? I know you alluded to it um, when you when we started this conversation, um, but I'll ask my question regardless. You know, uh, had you planned to leave at a certain age, or did you have do you have like a target level? I know you were EC minus one at that time when you left, or did you were you did you have like 
a stash of money somewhere and you had kind of saved all your career I said, okay well, once i hit this amount of money i'm going to just you know stop working you know what drove your decision to to leave at that time i think you know it's uh it may be good to give some background to, to before then because you know about um, after my first seven years of working in uh, in Shell in Nigeria, I went on an international assignment to the, the UK. It was initially supposed to have been a four-year assignment. It became seven years as an assignment, uh, and by the time I had so I had to come back to Nigeria uh, after the seventh year. I was supposed to have spent eight years, but the head of Shell in Nigeria wanted me to come back um, and in the discussion of when I was coming back um, we had discussed what other roles I would do even beyond uh, the role that I was going to do in Nigeria so I knew then that I was going to uh, move locations even in Nigeria um, and at that time my, my youngest son was uh, just a year old and uh, the oldest at that time was eight years old. So they were at that age that I didn't feel it was right to be moving them uh, around uh, so quickly. So I, I you know, took a decision that my, to keep my family in one place to make sure that the education of my children will not be disrupted uh, and they will have that stability. Uh, I was very fortunate my wife agreed with that plan, so she stayed back. So while I came to Nigeria, worked in Lagos, worked in Port Harcourt, worked in Boni, um, and then went to the Hague, which were four movements. So if I had moved my family around, I would have moved them, you know, four schools, four set of friends, four set of, uh, of relationships. I just didn't feel that was right for kids. But of course, in those four movements, um, I had also spent another, I think I spent another 80 years or so. Um, and so my children were now, you know, nearly 10. Uh, the oldest was already in the university. And I then said to myself, you know, the most important thing to me, I've said, is my God and my family. Uh, it seems as if I'm missing out of the young part of my children, their, their youth. And of course, once they finish university and, and leave the home, I might not have as much of a relationship with them outside that. Uh, because it's the relationship you build with the children while they are grown up. That's what determines whether they're still connected to you. But if you're a stranger who comes in during Christmas and comes in during holidays, then you don't have such a strong relationship. And so I felt, look, um, and, and of course, uh, as uh, the role that I was in, uh, they had discussed my next role with me, which, you know, I was covering 40 countries uh, in the role I was. The next role I was supposed to start covering about 80 countries. Uh, and I said, look, you know, this now will mean that I totally will miss out on the entire uh, youth of my children, their face of, of the youth face of my children, and, and I, I will become a stranger. And of course, I had been coaching many people around work-life balance, family, and I thought, you know, I'm not a great example myself uh, if, if this is what I do. So, you know, for me, you know, family came first, and uh, I, I had to decline to continue to pursue a career that, of course, I, I, I still had uh, headroom and uh, my next job had already been, been discussed with me, but uh, I, I just felt that um, I had to balance my family and I had sacrificed enough. Uh, and I felt uh, it was probably a good time as well. I'm still uh, relatively young. I can still do other things and uh, you know, do, it, do it with my children. So that's why I took the decision to go for early and uh, the company graciously agreed uh, and um, I'm quite pleased that their decision and they're spending time in the last year, although COVID has not brought everybody back or many, but I've, I mean, I've really enjoyed the last one year with my children and, um, and the family. It's been you know, some of the best times of, uh, of our family life. Okay, thank you very much for that, for that perspective. Uh, so clearly you don't have like a stash of money somewhere that they just um... <laughs> no really i mean it's one of the things i said in my book as well and i, and I said it very succinctly i said you know one of the things that i i, I have is contentment um 
most people don't know, but the last car I ever owned, even as a director, as a vice president and chair, was a small car called Kia Picanto. Uh, and it was, I love the car, very small, but it, it for me was able to take me where I wanted to go and, and do anything. And once you have contentment, your needs are minimal. Uh, and so, you know, the only, the only experience that I really have now is just to pay my children's school fees. I, you find out that the older you get, you don't even eat much. You can't, uh, uh, you know, do too many things. And I, I don't indulge in, in in things that require so much money. I, I've been fortunate to have worked for a a company that um, I think paid us very very well. Uh, I had, um, you know, I was pensionable as well. Uh, so you know, I, I was comfortable that I could pay my children's school fees and uh, what will be left will be my wife and myself and uh, we, we, we don't have so much needs that uh, require a huge amount of money. So contentment uh, is one thing I would say it makes the difference. If you are content, you don't need large amounts of money. If you are not contented, no amount of money can ever be enough. So what are you up to these days? Oh, I'm uh, back in school. I'm, uh, I'm back running a doctorate program in business admin in the Edinburgh Business School. Uh, fascinating to be back in classroom after uh, more than 20 years ago that I was last in the classroom. So it's a new experience again, but uh, I really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on uh, ESG uh, and the, as a field of study that I'm going to be carrying out my research on. So that's taking some of my time. But of course, I also sit on uh, the board of uh, some companies, oil and gas, as well as uh, some technology companies in the US, in Netherlands, in Nigeria. So I have a number of uh, non-executive uh, roles. I have managed to stay off executive roles because I, I don't want to find myself again in, uh, so quickly again in uh, not having enough time for my children. So uh, the, the doctorate and the non-executive roles provide enough uh, time. I'm also doing some NGO work as well. Yes, so, so having been, you know, someone who, who you know, packed his bag, you know, from, um, from Ilori to Lagos, you know, uh, squatting with friend uh, in, in Surulere, uh, with an uncle in Unipan, um, what advice do you have, you know, for someone who is in that situation right now, who is struggling, but has a great vision, a great plan, even for himself or for herself? You know, it's um, one of the stories you read in the book, indeed, as you described, um, was what I went through uh, while looking for a job. I mean, I, 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 I walked the streets of Lagos, I applied for hundreds of jobs, I... Uh, stayed with friends, stayed with uncles. Um, and um, of course, you know, it paid off with perseverance. I, I finally paid off when I got uh, work in Shell. So, you know, what I always, the first thing I say to people is don't don't be discouraged. You know, I think a number of people get discouraged easily. While I was looking for a job, there were many naysayers who said, you know, you know, some of these jobs, they will never give to you. You are the son of a farmer and a teacher. So don't even bother applying. Um, so, so firstly, I would say, never be discouraged. Um, pursue your dreams, pursue your aspirations. It will require sacrifice, so, so you must be ready to sacrifice. Some of the sacrifice means, indeed, as you described, I had to leave the comfort of, of learning where I had, my father had a house, I had I could eat three square meals, I had to now come and squat with friends, and, uh, you know, we were having to, you know, struggle. Um, but, you know, the goal was clear. Uh, so having a clear goal, never be discouraged. Um, be ready to, to, to go through the, the, the difficult times. You know, nothing comes easy, so you must be ready to go through the difficult times. Pursue your dreams, and um, you know, as I said, I applied for hundreds and hundreds of, of, of applications. Any time I, I used to walk on, on many Lagos roads, just looking for vacancies. Um, and you know, I think if you continue to do that and uh, you trust in, in your God. Uh, and, you, know, you don't have to have any any parent who has to, you know, some people believe that they need um, uh, an influential person to get them a job. I always tell people there's no need for any influential person. Who's more influential than God? So just, uh, you know, put down the struggle, 
continue to trust in God, work hard, um, and don't be discouraged. You know, pursue your dreams. Dreams come true. And as I said in my book, which is also what I said when I first went to NLNG, there are no impossibilities. We, the only impossibilities you have are the ones you set for yourself. So there are no impossibilities. You can climb, uh, you know, I, if I could climb from the storeroom where I started my career in Shell to becoming, you know, a member of several boards, uh, which was not a trajectory that had been seen before, uh, just means that there's no impossibilities. Um, and you need to have the right attitudes. Uh, you know, I, when you read my book, you will read about a lot of the traits that I think helped me in my career, things that helped me to, to progress, things that helped me to, to reach the highs that I reached. Um, and also, you, you know, organizations also will learn a lot about challenges that organizations face and, you know, how they can go about addressing some of those challenges as well. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, this essentially brings us to the end of the interview.